and just open it up to anyone who feels to to pray while I get up. Prayer group, there it is. I'll be happy to pray. <laughs> Thank you. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opening of this meeting and a chance to come together and um, discuss the Lord Jesus Christ and um, how we might come to thee and um, to know thee better and um, we pray for um, all the families within this hearing and all their loved ones, um, for many who are suffering uh, from physical ailments and um, other adversities that um, they will feel your strength with them and um, pray particularly for Carlene for her health to return and um, for the best possible outcome for her daughter and for Edith's daughter Tiffany and for uh, other children that might need um, a particular blessing upon them today and um, for Paula's daughter AJ um, I'm thinking of and for Julia's daughter as well and um, and my words are weak this morning and so um, I turn the prayer to anybody who would like to add to it Heavenly Father, I just offer a prayer of gratitude that we have the technology to meet together. We know that the knowledge of that came from you on how to create the internet and that we can sit with each other in, in each other's homes and study from the scriptures and seek to understand to a more fulsome and greater capacity your word in the scriptures and to understand who our Lord is. We pray that for each one of us that he may reveal himself unto us and we may be able to embrace the truth. That's all I feel bad. Father, we close this prayer in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we are up to O Falls. Gonna uh, switch. There we go. Um, anyone want to start reading and make it a little bigger too? There we go. I can read. I could read too. Um, okay, read you can go ahead, Matt. <laughs> then said, then he said unto them, "O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things?" and to enter into his glory? They and you do not understand. You do not understand because the prophets have said this exactly what our Lord would do. Should not Christ have suffered? Should not he have come in apparent weakness, vulnerability? Should not he have come in the very manner in which he appeared, and then to have suffered just as the prophets foretold? 
Is not the pattern always the same? Does not God manifest himself to the world through the weak things first? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Right here is the pattern followed in the New Testament Gospels framework. Christ explained how to understand his ministry. He used the scriptures and the prophets to understand how the mundane events fit the foretold glory. He uses such small means, they are unseen except through faith. Only when the small means accomplish what God foretold, are they mighty to save. Only the scriptures are able to define what matters and how God's hand is moving to fulfill his purposes. <clears throat> it was this framework, later used by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when composing their testimonies of Christ. They also wove into their record how Christ fulfilled the prophecies. In each of the four Gospels, there is a format that mirrors what the Lord did as he spoke on the road to Emmaus with these two disciples. He proved Christ came and suffered as he ought to have done, because all the prophets were fulfilled in him. Therefore, he opened unto them scriptures that they might understand. Our Lord could have testified of himself by revealing 10,000 new truths. Our Lord could have disclosed and preached and delivered practically any new content he chose to deliver. But instead, our Lord expounded the scriptures concerning him. That should tell you something about how he prefers for us to learn the truth. When the Lord first spoke to me, he expounded the scriptures about the restoration. When he appeared on the day of his resurrection, his visit with everyone that day, but these two on the road to Emmaus was brief, even perfunctory, and included only a small amount of information. Essentially, he proved he had risen. But he, but here we read of the Lord taking hours, walking and talking, opening up in a discourse in which he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They did not, not recognize who he was, but they were moved by the content of his sermon. When they arrived at Emmaus, he came in because they asked him to stay. If they had not asked, he would have passed by. That also tells you something important about our Lord. He does not force himself upon you. You must invite. Well, you can read the rest of the account in Luke's chapter. But at the end of the encounter, they said to one another... Did not our heart burn within us while we talked with while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? It was the exposition of the scriptures that led that let them know. I do not believe it is necessary to reveal any new thing in order to be able to teach in a way that opens eyes to everything the Lord has and is doing. Apart from expounding the scriptures, he didn't think it was necessary either. Look at the Lord's first appearance to Joseph Smith. Go to verse 19 of the Joseph Smith history and read the words the Lord speaks to Joseph. He quotes or paraphrases Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Paul. In just one short run-on sentence, the Lord talks about the doctrines being taught for commandments were the doctrines of men. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, once again, when he appears to Joseph in the first vision, our Lord is expounding the scriptures. He picks out from the language of his prophets, phrasing to tell Joseph, this is the condition in which you find yourself. This is what the prophets were speaking about. This is when mankind should search the earth and not find the word of God. When Moroni came to visit with Joseph Smith, what did he do with Joseph? Remember, this was to train Joseph for the ministry he was about to begin. Moroni quoted prophecies from Malachi, Isaiah, Peter, and Joel. Thank you. If we could just pause it there for a second, um, just to see if there's any comments, thoughts to share. I like the, uh, today for me, when I contemplate what does it look like for me to walk on the road to Emmaus 
And I think Andrew found out that Emmaus means warm springs or hot springs. There's a meaning uh, there about that. And can I detect the Lord walking with me along the way? And how, how do I invite him to stay and stop? I appreciate also the reminder of it's the scriptures, like to know Christ, it's the scriptures are no better source. And to not look to any of the messengers that he sends to receive that knowledge because true messengers will point to Christ using the word of scripture. Good morning, Julia. <laughs> Good morning. Oops. Any other comments or thoughts? Uh, the scripture that came to mind earlier in the reading was uh, small and simple means great things come to pass. It's interesting that it's in the small things that God is doing his greatest work. And is are we paying attention to to what he is up to? <laughs> Although that almost makes him sound conniving. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in one way it might be, in another way it's like, are you paying attention? Or, you know. That the world will keep doing what it's doing and the Lord has to, will just go forward. And those who have eyes to see and ears to hear will notice, will notice what is happening. And there, are, I think there are people who, yeah, I guess even amongst us who think, they, we know what God is up to, but it's like that whole idea that the prophecies won't be, you, you won't see the prophecies fulfilled until after it's done. As uh, something looking back and going, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he was fulfilling what he's said from the beginning. Well, it makes okay. sense. It makes sense that um, that the scriptures would be a means. Like the Holy Ghost is a means to connect Christ to other to to oh. us and to each other, um, um, almost like I don't I don't I can't think of a good way to describe it, but maybe if you had Christ on one side of a tennis court and and all the prophets and teachers on the other side and and he's sharing his word to them and then they give it back um exactly as he gave it and you know and then he shares his word with another and he and they give it back and um and in that exchange you can it's it's like the words or the net in a way and and you can see um the truth of what is being um bantered back and forth like i said i don't have a good way to explain but um but yeah it's you can't accept the word the word of god without it being god's word so <laughs> it makes um, all kinds of sense that uh that the scriptures would be used as that um, volleying place to to exchange um, the word when when Christ the Lord our Redeemer word um, is behind them and also in front of them. <laughs> Thank you, for and I like that image of the tennis court. That's very visual for me and speaks and that makes my mind dive deep into that. 
I was uh, thinking about, uh, maybe we read it in the beginning this morning, or maybe it was the last part we read yesterday where it said, where Denver said, it takes faith to come aboard, it takes faith to see it underway. And I looked up those words and I realized, like I found, and you probably already know this, um, but those are nautical terms, faith to come aboard and faith to see it underway. Um, and so faith to see it underway, um, I think underway um, is when the ship begins to move. It's not tied or held down by the anchor and it's not tied to anything physical on the dock. And faith to come aboard, um, it was something about being at the side of the ship. Um, I don't know, Matt might know more of those nautical terms, but. Um, I was, was going to say, you're right about the, the come aboard is going on the ship when it's tied up and everything else. It's tied to the thing. Sometimes it'll like when the seas are high, it'll be thrashing back and forth. And so like when the ship's sitting there jumping and you're walking up to the pier, yeah, it can take a little fear to things heaving and everything else when you're trying to go across the plank. And then underway, you're absolutely right. When the ship's powered by its own power, instead of like the little boats pushing it out or whatever else, and then it's uh, under its own power, you're underway. Interesting oh. how um, those words were used. <laughs> uh, yes, that is. I had never noticed that in nautical terms. And then you said that, and I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. The good ship Zion. <laughs> Truly. <sighs> Okay. Oh, are you waiting on me to read? I'm sorry. Get with it, Matt. Gosh. <laughs> it took a long time for me to recognize the pattern. It's time for me to read. But now I know the pattern in which the Lord reveals and discusses new truth is the same in every generation. So when he came in the answer to prayer and spoke to me sitting in the barracks, despite the fact there were no fireworks, no pillar of fire, no shining man in a robe, he used the scriptures and expounded them to increase my understanding. I grew to understand the Lord is indeed the same yesterday, today, and forever. His path is straight, and his course is one eternal round. Therefore, today I want to use the scriptures and the words of the prophet Joseph Smith to bear testimony of who our Lord is and how significant his example is for us. I've told you previously in Idaho Falls that the lectures on faith are scripture. They are adopted as scripture by the church, and we covered that before. This is from the seventh lecture on faith, paragraph nine, about Christ. Where shall we find a saved being? For if we can find a saved being, we may ascertain without much difficulty what all others must in order to be saved. We think that, if, that it will not be a matter of dispute that two beings who are unlike each other cannot both be saved. For whatever constitutes the salvation of one will constitute the salvation of every creature which will be saved. And if we find one saved being in all existence, we may see what all others must be or else not be saved. We ask then, where is the prototype or where is the saved being? We conclude as to the answer of this question, there will be no dispute among those who believe the Bible that it is Christ. All will agree in this that he is the prototype or standard of salvation, or, in other words, that he is a saved being. And if we should continue in our interrogation and ask how it is that he is saved, the answer would be, because he is a just and holy being. And if he were anything different from what he is, he would not be saved. For his salvation depends on his being precisely what he is and nothing else. Or if it were possible for him to change in the least degree, so sure he would fail of salvation and lose all his dominion, power, authority, and glory, which constitute salvation. For salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion which Jehovah possesses, and in nothing else. And no being can possess it but himself, or one like him. When you read this language... Do not succumb to the temptation to gloss over it. Do not think salvation consists of Christ magically applying fairy dust to make us like him. 
If Christ could make us like him, that would be Luciferian. It would be abrogate. It would abrogate free will. It would save without respecting agency. We have the freedom to choose because without that, we would not exist. Therefore, to preserve our existence, there cannot be any magic elevation of man. Rather, man must ascend by degrees and through experience to become like God. And Jesus Christ is the prototype who has proven this ascent is possible. This was taught by Joseph Smith in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. This is the material he spent his time editing and perfecting before its publication. His diary does not say he spent any time revising the revelations. That was entrusted to a committee responsible for getting those ready to publish. When the committee prepared the revelations, they did something. They did some freelancing, embellishing and expanding. Some of the stuff they added to the revelations was remarkably more expansive than what Joseph had revealed. But, but the revelations are not where Joseph spent his time to, prior to the publication of the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. He spent his time with the lectures on faith. This was relatively early in his ministry. The church was incorporated in 1830. He would spend 14 years as its leader. While Joseph presided, the church was true and living because Joseph spoke with and for God. The lectures were prepared five years into Joseph's church ministry. It is clear he wanted to make sure the doctrine was correct. This is the doctrine he prepared for that first publication of the Doctrine and Covenants. Yet despite that, we tend to rarely read this, and when we do, it is not taken seriously. If you are going to be saved, you must be exactly, you must be precisely what Christ is and nothing else. You at the moment, when you are saved, this is what you must be, or else not be saved. Christ is the prototype, and we must mirror him. He proved God the Father's word by doing what the Father asked. This is how Christ identified himself to the Nephites. He suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. Or in other words, Christ was obedient before this world was. And this world started in its creation after Christ was first qualified to redeem it. As a consequence of that doctrine, to speak of Christ is necessarily to speak of salvation. To understand Christ is to understand salvation. Your salvation is to be understood as requiring from you exactly what was required of Christ. You cannot be different from Christ and yet be saved because your salvation depends upon you being precisely what he is and nothing else. Despite how plainly this has been put, we will stop short of comprehending this doctrine. We pause it for a second. It sounds like a daunting thing um, to just read it at first glance. If you are going to be saved, you must be exactly, you must be precisely what Christ is and nothing else. And I think about all the weaknesses and um, the frailties of that I hold within me and the things that I struggle with and are challenged by uh, daily and It's, it would seem like an impossible thing were it not that I understand that Christ descended below all things. And I love in that youth talk where it was expressed that what if Christ was the most tempted um, and yet he was able to pass through that and give it no heed and So even the, the very weakest man or woman, <laughs> Christ even descended below that. And so there's always hope. Christ descended below all things and he made it above all things. And so if I can take hold of his garment and my heart be open to his succor, he has prepared a way for me um, to truly become like him. Mm -hmm. 
and it won't be for me all accomplished in this lifetime, uh, but a progressive journey throughout eternity. <clears throat> that was just some of my thoughts. I was looking at the how we have to mirror him in, in previous discussions. We talk about how sometimes when we see something that bothers us about someone else, it's a mirror of uh, and reflection of our own selves. But I was thinking about how we have to mirror Christ that when he appears or when he comes that we will see him as he is because we will be like him. And the whole, the whole idea of the refinished fire and the purifying of silver comes to mind. Like <clears throat> his reflection will be in us. And how, the, how does that work? You know, and the fact that he immediately forgives him um, when we come into his presence. I think that just cleans us up and that makes us like him in the, in the sense that we're clean before him. Not perfect, but as perfect as we can be, I guess, in this life. Um, <laughs> yeah. I I like how you mentioned the mirror and we often see the weaknesses in others and it is perhaps a potential that we have within ourselves or we do have within ourselves. And so it made me think of when Christ brings us into his presence and forgives our sin. Um, we see the potential for ourselves to become like Christ um, in that moment, um, is that how we mirror him? Because we, we see that within ourselves and that potential going forward. I think maybe when we learn why things why Christ is the way, then we have the potential to become like him because we'll have that same understanding, that same knowledge. And so I think sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, so I think sometimes we kind of push ourselves to be, 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 do, 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 so that we can be like Christ, whereas if we instead become like Christ, then the being and the doing will become natural to us because we'll be like him. And so maybe understanding, I think that knowledge of why this, you know, why something is... Um, to use, you know, the harsh term is evil or why something is good um, or godly uh, and how it can be sustained in eternity or not be sustained in eternity um, in, a, in a godly way. This helps a lot to, to act because then you you understand why you're acting in such a way that is that is also sustainable in a godly way, I guess. In whatever capacity we're able to do that, which of course is somewhat limited, but thank you for calling. A lot to think about in all these um, paragraphs. And I, I wonder, like, does it always require suffering? Um, 
Yes. <laughs> right. I'm like, is there no other way? Like, does it always require suffering? I guess so. If Christ only does what he saw his father do, I guess in order to become Christed, it always requires suffering and coming to the descending below all things. Well, and even uh, suffering can be just be, I mean, sometimes suffering entails pain and sometimes suffering entails knowledge and sometimes suffering just entails carrying, um, carrying something. I mean, the word suffer literally means to carry, right? So, um, but yeah. I think so. <laughs> I think it always it always requires suffering and often pain. <laughs> I guess there's an element of suffering too to like Christ will not force us. I think it was mentioned somewhere back here. Um, that would be Luciferian for Christ to force us. And so he has to suffer with us patiently, I guess. Well, we make and choose for ourselves, make our own choices, choose for ourselves. I guess there's an element of suffering in there too, like Christ suffered, it be so. <laughs> um, until we willingly align ourselves. Sorry, Paul, are we going to say something? My mind is fighting to... Uh... Uh, talk Stephanie gave, and I was trying to recall which one it was, uh, although I, I'm trying to uh, <clears throat> phrase it like she did. Uh, like pain is necessary, but suffering is optional, I think, something along that line. If we don't have to suffer, so we have to go through pain. There's a difference. <clears throat> yeah, I have to think about that. Is that that we have to go through circumstances that cause us pain? Do we wallow in it and in suffering, or um, allow ourselves to learn from the experience and rise above it to? you know, and drawing closer to the Lord. I don't know if that makes sense. It is. I can recall what talk that was. I don't remember. <laughs> of course, I, uh, I didn't completely agree with her, but as I think about it, I think there's an element of truth in that. We, we don't have to wallow in that pain and suffer them it's not gonna come out right so <laughs> yeah that's a hard one for me to wrap my head around too and and truthfully while you were saying that I was thinking I kind of understand what she's saying like when it comes to my own stuff and my own suffering um, from my own choices the suffering for me comes when I won't receive Christ's forgiveness and I mm. want to keep holding on to all my baggage and, and you know, whipping myself and pouring ashes on my head and, uh, and all of that when Christ invites me to rise up, look up, move forward, dust yourself off, have hope, uh, receive my sucker. Like that's when my suffering comes. But then when it comes to... Um, the wounds inflicted on me from others for me there is some suffering there because like there's I have to go through the process of wanting justice or like I don't know coming in coming to forgiveness being able to move through that so I don't know and, and it says in the scriptures that Christ suffered so he did go through suffering Yeah. 
But it, and then all of that. suffered more than man can bear, right? right. He suffered. He, more he learned to rise above that. That's, I, maybe that's the thing is we we go through the pain and suffering, and then he's he's inviting us to not don't stay down there. Get up! I sh I've done it. You can do it too. You can get above that suffering to a, a place of peace and um, and uh, becoming one with Him, if you will, inviting us to take hold of that atonement, like you were talking about. It's that extending His hand, and He's willing to walk with us through that to come to the same place he is. Reminds me of in Gethsemane, I would say that Christ suffered in that account that we have, um, the recent account in our scriptures. I would say that that was suffering beyond comprehension. Um, and I think what Christ is inviting us to do is through him, uh, reconcile ourselves to the Father and find our way back. Because like Juan said, I think pain and suffering is necessary. Uh, but like he said, more to not stay there. Christ always found his way back to peace and reconciliation with the Father. I can't keep from thinking today, and my mind's kind of strangely enough, but um Paula was reading something in my mind I uh, jumped to how we are light and so my mind started thinking on light being the electronics person I am and 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 radio and what you'll find is we or the way my mind is thinking there are sounds down here in this place in other words I make a sound we can hear it and the sound will travel through the various mediums water air whatever else and it'll go so far Christ is uh is light and his frequency, um, if we get close enough to that frequency, our sound waves can be embedded on his light wave and he can carry us. Yeah. So in other words, if we conform to a certain pattern, his light wave will carry us and it'll go millions of miles and everything else. And when it gets to where it's going, you can take the sound wave off of his signal. In other words, it'll ride that other signal. So I, I kind of think how like a radio set is designed it takes all the frequencies that aren't Christ because you've tuned it to him and it rejects those that are above and all those that are below it rejects. And so you tune into the one and then you embed your signal on it. And so I kind of think how if we tune to that signal, we're the same as that signal. We vibrate the same. If we're any other way and we vibrate differently, we can't see him. He'll become invisible to us. And so we has to we have to become as he he is in order to be like him to see him. And then he can carry us. We can be embedded on his signal and he can carry us wherever he needs to go. So I was just kind of seeing how the scriptures and the physical world and our hearts really all align. It's all the same process. See that what you're saying in is something that was written in the second comforter that in tuning into God's frequency almost exactly as you were saying in that was just this harmony when we figure out Christ's harmony his wave if you will and becoming in tune to that I'm trying to remember where that was <laughs> but might have been in the doing and being chapters and pulling it up as talks about music and harmony. That was beautiful, Matt. Thank you. Hmm. It makes sense, actually. Maybe, uh, let me just skip to the other people. Um, Colleen, do you have any thoughts? Or Julia, Camilla? I'm just listening. Just nice to listen. <laughs> I 
Thanks for asking. I'm with Carlene. I'm listening while I'm trying to make a lunch and a breakfast for Darl. He's leaving for the day. <laughs> Thanks for letting me sneak in. You're always you. welcome. Um, I read something really quick. Of course, I'd love that. When you feel this harmony and closeness, so I'm, and when it goes back to being coming in harmony with the Lord, remember it when you are in balance, in harmony and at rest, you can feel his presence. Feel it, follow it, lean when he leans, and you will learn quicker what it is you are trying to accomplish with your heart, might, mind, and strength. Been keeping his commandments. Now try to feel the underlying state it was intended to bring you to. God did not give you a mere rule book, He gave you something much greater. It is harmony and symphony, but more of a feeling than a thought. It is an experience, and not just an analysis, which brings you into balance as thin as a razor's edge. I'm thinking about what Matt was saying, it just brings me to that keeping the commandments following because it's in the keeping and commandments that we know the Lord and understand who he is and then we become in harmony with him anyway. yeah, I'm talking. <laughs> it's it's really hard to keep your mind always in harmony at least for me I don't know how anybody have any ideas how you do that other than just read the cons the scriptures constantly. <laughs> I was envisioning myself like um, when I use the radio, which is very rare in the car. But you know, when you're trying to find like the right signal and it's like staticky and you're trying to like get it precisely where it is. Um, to hear the music properly and for it to come through clear. I often feel like I'm that. <laughs> My life is always trying to, it's the static -y part. I'm trying to find that perfection on the dial of the radio. Um, and how do I increase my own frequency to connect with that Christ frequency? Well, I think here it's saying the scriptures and yeah studying the scriptures I feel is definitely part of that but also I think not only studying but in the doing and the uh, in service to one another yeah I, yeah. I like that I just um, we're just so mortal it's, 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 mortality is such a um, mortal thing that um, well that's where go ahead Camilla um, it's just thinking that I mean Eva, Eva's right that we have to be doing as well because like the scholars who just sat around studying and arguing over scriptures um, they clearly missed the mark when Christ came and um, he condemned a lot of their ideas and philosophies and actions. And um, they would find workarounds to not take care of their parents when their parents were elderly and say, oh, well, I gave my money to the temple, so I don't have to help my parents. And, uh, you know, there were there were all kinds of ways that they would argue the law and work around it. And ultimately, God wants that law to be in our hearts. And yes, we have to study it to know it. But we have to do it to be able to put it in our hearts and we have to have that heart of charity in the way that we do it and not, you know, be doing it just so people see it. And 
to say, yay, I'm awesome. I did it. You know, there's, and so there's, there's so much, um, I want to say nuance <laughs> in, uh, not just doing, but also changing our hearts and not just studying, but also doing. <laughs> and so what, so, so what I hear you saying is that when we're tuning our radio, like Kiva mentioned, then when choices come up, that's when we really can exercise being in harmony, other than when we're reading the scriptures. And uh, I like that. Like that. It it really is so much choice, isn't it? Yeah. I like that. Thanks. Yeah. I really like what you said, Camilla, about all the studying. I think that is hated. It is knowledge. But when we do it, it put that knowledge proceeds into our heart. I really like that. Right. Me too. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of where that um, verse in the answering covenant about um you'll learn things that you can learn in no other way something something along those lines i can look it up uh you'll come to know things that you can learn in no other way I, uh i'm getting it wrong so i don't remember that one for <laughs> I'm looking it up right now, so I don't. I recognize what she's talking about. Yeah. My brain is like too early. I don't have a coffee. Mm -hmm. okay, along the lines of what I'm thinking of, I think I remember hearing Denver saying something about the monk who can live peacefully all alone in the mountains meditating, but when he comes down the road and is forced to interact with other people he's not sure how to live peacefully anymore mm -hmm. um and you know if, oh. if if just sitting and studying were enough then you know frankly that'd be pretty easy but <laughs> figuring out how to how to live and work together with other people who think and act differently than you and who chose to research different things. And so they don't know the thing that you know, and you don't know the thing that they know. And you're like, why don't you think like I do? Well, they have different experiences that they're coming to that situation with and to learn to have patience with each other and learn to open ourselves up to listening to each other's perspectives before we jump to any kind of judgment or anything like that. Um, that's, that's where it all comes in and we can't, I don't know. We can't, we can't be Christ-like without that patience and that openness to learning what other people's experiences are. Cause no, he never judged the publicans and sinners. He ate with them and forgave them and taught them how to change. And if there's anyone he judged, it was the scholars. <laughs> there's that uh, scripture. Do my works and you will know my doctrine. For you will uncover hidden mysteries by obedience to these things that can be uncovered in no other way. This is the way I will restore knowledge to my people. Thank you. Right for yeah. Go ahead, Matt. I was just saying that's right out of the covenant. I, rec I recognize the tone when she was saying it. Mm -hmm. That... Uh... You I think can also say it helps to remember that we're... Go ahead, Ms. Eva. No, I was going to ask you if you were going to say something, Vaughn. <laughs> I was just going to say, 
that it helps to remember thinking on Carlene's um, idea about staying in that and well, kind of what everybody's been talking about, that staying <clears throat> in that frequency of Christ and um, I think it helps to remember, like you said, that Eva, that uh, he did descend below it all, so he has walked, like Camilla said, <laughs> with each of us in the exact details of all our suffering. And so he, he has experienced that and he has come to, like somebody else probably said, um, he has reconciled himself. Um, even with our pain, even with our suffering, even with each of our lives, he is reconciled to the Father. And that's why we can be reconciled to the Father. And But while we're here and we've forgotten and we're, there's a veil and all these kinds of things, um, maybe it's hard to realize and just how close we are to God how close God is even that that they are within us around us in all things through all things and that <laughs> um and so it's really it's really more that we are already there but we have to make our hearts will to that um harmony that that we persuade ourselves we experience the things that we experience so that we can understand in our hearts as Camilla was saying why things are the way they are and why we desire to be in that frequency of the Lord and allow him to carry all the things that we've suffered and are suffering and or will suffer um with us uh for us even suffered that that they might not have to suffer right the scripture there um i have suffered that they might not have to suffer um something like that and yeah i just made a muddle of all that but anyway, <laughs> i just think uh, short short just short version it helps to remember that this is part of the plan <laughs> you know to be here and to be in the muck and so yeah and that that doesn't mean that we can't also be with our lord uh, through the holy ghost thank you Fawn. that reminds me of i think uh the lord when he says what more could I have done? It is seen like, has he left anything at all undone in his ministry um, throughout his entire ministry, uh, even before he came into the flesh? Like, what more could he have done? And I think uh, perhaps he, he has laid out enough um, and shown the way, and it's my own will, <laughs> defiant will, or the scriptures say, um, by our own sad experience. Um, I recognize that in my own life, that I have chosen my own sad experience to walk through things. And then when I've walked through it, I realize, well, Christ laid out the path that I could have avoided that. <laughs> I could have avoided that. Um, but then there is something too, when I choose my own sad experience, I feel... Christ is there or available to me immediately, even in my own sad experience when I choose that. So I don't think there is ever a time when we are utterly alone or don't have help through everything that we go through and choose as well. Well, and sometimes the baby needs to touch the stove. Sometimes that is the only way to understand that's certainly been for me
Well, or just um, be close enough to feel the heat without <laughs> yeah. getting burned. <laughs> right. Yeah. But without this sad experience, we see that pretty orange glowing thing and we want to stick our hand on it. <laughs> and then we have a sad experience and we know better. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciated this post. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to read it now, but if you want to look it up, or we, I mean, we could if you, how long is it? Not very. I found this one last night, and it's uh, to do with uh, coming to understand Christ and the scriptures. And uh, he got an email and he titled it, What's Wrong? My wife and I, with some other believers, this is the email he received, were baptized recently. I fully expected that now I could receive the power of the Holy Ghost. I believed what you said, that today is once again a day of salvation, and he has set his hand again. If today is a day of salvation, then surely he will now hear my prayers and pour out his spirit upon us who are striving with all our hearts to become to come unto him it has been over two weeks since my baptism the entire time i have been pleading with the lord to forgive my sins and allow me to enter in at the gate i have felt nothing i talked to one of the other couples who were also baptized that day and they told me they had felt their baptism was pleasing to god as they saw a white dove fly by their car as they drove to the chosen spot that day yet they likewise have received no outpouring of the spirit this has been very discouraging for them and me the husband of that couple remarked to me that he has been thinking is this just another pantomime have we been following another illusion i have also read the experiences of others on forums and facebook etc who have been similarly similarly baptized since your last lecture there seems to be a lack of outpourings of the spirit or baptism of fire experiences your words from your books and your recent talks speak to me as they do to others i'm willing to accept they come from god i just don't understand why he isn't following through with his promises I desire to receive the baptism of fire and to take the Holy Spirit as my guide. I've tried to keep the commandments to the best of my knowledge, and I believe others have as well. I don't know what we are doing wrong. I gave this response. The Holy Ghost has the primary effect, primary effect giving intelligence to man. It is true there are many gifts from the Holy Ghost, but the first most important and clearest effect is to increase intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. The Holy Ghost grows in light as we give heed and diligence to the light. These are all paraphrases from teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and Doctrine and Covenants. Ask yourself, do you believe you understand better now and before your journey began. Do you believe you can see more clearly what you need to do next? Do the scriptures reveal more to you now than before you began this process? Is there any more intelligence or light and truth in your life today than before? If you can answer any of these, yes, then do not doubt, but press on. I have labored decades to learn what I have learned and spent some time daily now studying, praying, contemplating and pondering. Although I have had remarkable experiences, I continue to study because the things of God are of things of God are deep and require careful, patient, solemn and ponderous thought to acquire some of what he has made available. I believe he will not give an original revelation to reveal what he has already revealed to us in scripture. Instead, he requires us to first study his words. Then when scripture becomes unable to answer the inquiry, he shows us by revelation 
how to see what is there before us. Some of the greatest things I have beheld by revelation, I have then found to be already described in scripture. I just did not have the eyes to see it, the eyes yet to see it. Trust God, but follow his pattern. If on the day of his resurrection, Christ spent the day expounding scripture, and if Moroni spent the night teaching and reteaching from the scriptures, and if I spent a year on an assignment expounding scripture, then look to your scriptures, see if you have any assistance studying them. Let them prove to your satisfaction the Holy Ghost can and will speak to you. As I reflected further on this email and my response, I thought of Oliver Cowdery's effort to translate the Book of Mormon. The Holy Ghost does not relieve us of great effort, but instead equips us to obtain truth as the yield from our effort. Joseph Smith proved the pattern true. He investigated all the religions. He attended their meetings, spoke with the ministers and paid attention to their claims. He could not determine the truth. Then he labored over the scriptures at length. <laughs> he finally decided to do as James asks and prayed. His prayer was answered because he did the preliminary work the required study, and put in the necessary labor. For three decades, I studied and taught the scriptures. Each week, between 10 to 40 hours were invested as I prepared to teach a 50-minute class. I labored, the scriptures yielded to study, and I learned more and more about God. The vision of the redemption of the dead found in section 138 was likewise obtained by study and prayer. The scriptures are a Urim and Thummim designed to provoke revelation. You cannot divorce the process of getting revelation from necessary scripture study. God made no such thing known to Laman, Lemuel, or us when we do not search the scriptures and invest our heart and mind in learning his ways. I have studied the scriptures for years by now they, they inform most every thought. Fill yourself with scripture and see what the Holy Ghost can do then. Read them now and see how they open to you. If you take no thought except to ask and expect God to do the work, you do not understand the difference between magic and salvation. We are saved no quicker than we gain knowledge. Study the scriptures, include the lectures on faith as part of that curriculum. Study Joseph Smith, prepare your mind first, then see what God will reveal to you. In that talk, when the, the person's writing the letter and it's saying, you know, we, we, we were baptized and then we were kind of watching for changes and so forth. I remember from the Book of Mormon, it talks about when the Spirit came upon them, they knew it not. So in other words, it was very subtle. It's not a big clamoring bong hitting the gong. Christ is coming to you in a very, very subtle way, trying to fine-tune you, not completely rattle you or put you on a whole new track. <laughs> and so I kind of think of it that way, that how... We must have patience to look for the difference. After you've done a thing, like you plant the seed, then it takes time before that seed sprouts up. It just doesn't pop up the next day. It takes a little more hope and faith and watering and yet love before it'll start to, to grow. And then it's going to be a while yet before it blooms. So. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Any other thoughts before we close for the day? Okay. I, I can say that um, I think I've felt like that at times, what was expressed in that letter, just wondering, did I really get the spirit or did I just think that I did? And um, 
yeah, it's, it, it can be hard when God works in these subtle ways. And then we read the scriptures where he works in big dramatic uh, experiences and to, to say, well, if I believe in God and I believe he is the same, why isn't he doing a big dramatic experience for me? <laughs> and um, so I can, I can see how it would be hard to, I, uh, when, when it is slow and subtle and you know it not that the spirit came upon you, um, to, to still be strong and not have any doubts about it coming upon you. But in these discussions, people have said that they've really been enriched by comments and that I've made. And I've been enriched by comments that other people have made. And that is the fruit of the spirit for us to learn and grow from each other. And so... Um, so I think that is just showing that we did get it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Camilla. Yeah, and I love those questions of looking back, do we see growth through all these years? And I could answer yes for myself to each of those questions, like Matt said, little by little, uh, sure but steady. And when I, I like the analogy of when we plant a seed, we let it grow. We don't keep digging it up to see if it's got roots or like that'll eventually kill it. it. Takes an element of faith and nurture and love. I like that you said love, Matt. Um, and water for it to grow. Julia, do you have any comments? Thank you, everyone. It's so sweet to be a fly on your wall. Okay. I got well, breakfast and lunch ready and Darl's off for the day. And you. thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Okay, let's pray. Anyone want to offer that prayer? May I? Thank you, Julia, that would be wonderful. Your Father in heaven, with grateful hearts, we praise you this morning and thank you so much for this blessing of gathering. Thank you for the promise that we're two more gathered. Your spirit will be there, and we thank you for that pouring of your spirit and teachings. Your stretched forth hand to us this morning. Gratefully, we praise you and pray that we will receive what you would have us receive, be found, always remembering you and aligning all that we do with you so that we can be more like you. We are so grateful. Pray that we will serve you this day and thought and word and deed. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Bye. Safe journey, Matt. Thank you. Have a great day. Love you all. Love you all. Thank you. Yeah, bye, everyone. Thank you.
Colleen. Have a good day.